Happy Saturday. Good to see everybody joining in just a second, both on YouTube and Facebook Live. I set it up for both today for a couple of reasons. Lately, I've just been doing my podcast facts and putting it out on there, but I have been asked within the community of Explore Christianity to do some of these videos live stream. There's without a doubt, without a doubt, that Second Peter is the most requested uh, video that I have received to do canonical statuses. Uh, I, I figured out of many of the books that we have covered thus far, the pastorals being one of the most common as well, it had a lot of views and it had a lot of downloads based on the podcast side, but it was not as many requested for that one as there is for this one. Also, I was very surprised when I when I polled how many people wanted to see which books of the Bible, how often this one showed up in comparison to the book of Revelation, the book of James, and the book of Jude. This is without a doubt the number one requested video. So I figured I'd do it on both platforms. I'll also be posting it on my uh, podcast facts here right after the live stream recording. Uh, you are more than welcome if you want to watch this in the live stream and in the chat. Uh, and put in any comments that you would like. If you want to join into the discussion, you're, you're free to do that. I'd love to have you join in and leave your opinion uh, in the uh, comment department. And if I have time, and I don't know that I will, I will try to take uh, some comments and questions at the very end. Let me go ahead and jump right into it, because I think this is so important. When we get into the book of Second Peter, there is no dispute whether you're talking about the ancient church or even people in the modern church, seeing differences between 2 Peter and 1 Peter. Looking at the things, for example, when you're dealing with the discussion of syntax and grammatical structure and vocabulary, there is without a doubt, whether you're talking about Jerome's statement about it, Eusebius' statement about it, or even modern scholarship statement, they are not the same writer. There does not appear to be in the written tradition the same style, the same format, the same background, the same education level between Second Peter and First Peter. And I'm here to say I don't argue with that. I think that is legit. I think when you read the Greek in Second Peter, it is very different from the Greek in First Peter. The choice of vocabulary when describing things is different from Second Peter and First Peter. So I have no problem recognizing the differences. The only question that we have to ask ourselves is, why are there differences with the same author being attributed to both? And did the early church struggle with this themselves? I mean, what do we do about differences? Does that negate the fact that it could be and might be Peter doing both or behind both or involved in both projects? So those are things that I want to examine today. I want to take time uh, to look into. It is without a doubt debatable. The question is, did Peter write this epistle? Now, there is indication very early on that Peter did write this epistle. One of the earliest is Origen. He stated when he was doing his commentary on Joshua, and actually, if you remember in my video, if you watch the video or the audio clip of Jude, you'll remember I used this quote of Origen to demonstrate that he believed Jude, 1st, 2nd Peter were all canonical books, going back to Jude and Peter. Here's the quote. When our Lord Jesus Christ comes, whose arrival is a prior to the son of none, talk about Joshua, designated, he sends priests, his apostles, bearing trumpets, hammered thin, the magnificent and heavenly instruction of proclamation. Matthew first sounded the priestly trumpet in his gospel. Mark also, Luke and John each played their own priestly trumpet. Even Peter cries out with trumpets in two of his epistles, also James and Jude. He's dealing with the trumpets. And remember, Origen did a lot of allegory. He took the Old Testament very allegorical. And so when he saw the trumpets that were blown when Joshua was about to attack, he gives numbers to that saying, well, these were almost prophetic and they were allegorical, reflecting, sounding the trumpets that were going to send forth Jesus at his coming and his first coming. And then he says that one of those trumpets was Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. And then he mentions the others. And that two were from Peter, one from James, one from Jude, one uh, going back to those writers. But, but Peter 
had two. So he already indicates early on there's two coming from him. Irenaeus, in his third book against heresies, writing his work that's famous to notice against heresies, we meet an allusion to Peter, specifically 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. I remember Irenaeus was trained under Polycarp, who was trained by John the Apostle himself. So he was very close to the apostolic group, very close to the information of the apostolic group. He's already alluding to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, and he's attributing the statement to Peter and one that he gives of another passage of Paul, calling those statements Peter's statement and Paul's statement. Hippolytus of Rome, living at the really the very beginning of the third century, he was acquainted with this epistle. In fact, when he was writing about who the Antichrist would be, he actually goes to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, and utilizes that as a reference point to describing and warning of Antichrist and his agenda. Eusebius, the church historian working under, under Constantine uh, during the early fourth century, he deals with this and wrestles with the fact that it was a disputed book. He actually seems to indicate that Peter didn't write it at times, but then when he went to his canonical list, he said that it was disputed yet received along with Jude and some of the others. So he, he doesn't deny its canonicity. He doesn't deny its early usage. He struggles with the fact that it wasn't used as often as some of the others, but he does dispute it. But he also accepts it into the canonical apostolic text, oddly enough. But he does not negate it as apostolic. So when I've listened to critics against 2 Peter, they simply go, well, Eusebius didn't even accept it. He says right here that Peter wrote a single epistle, and we don't know who wrote the second, uh, and not everybody in the church has received it. But they don't read the whole story of Eusebius. Working through the details of these books, working through the disputes of these books, at the end of the day, you have to consider the fact that though, yes, Eusebius contested the idea of Peter writing it, he did not exclude it from the apostolic collection of canonical books. In the end, that's where he placed it. So we have to keep that in mind. But in there, he also shows that Clement of Alexandria, which is the end of the second century predominantly, knew of the epistle of Peter and even makes the argument that he wrote a commentary on the second epistle of Peter. It appears also based on my doctoral dissertation, and I've shown the graph and sent it out to many of you in the past, demonstrating that that first Clement at the end of the first century very likely refers to second Peter. Uh, it could be argued on two occasions. In fact, I was about a year ago, maybe even longer than that, I was on Dr. James White's program, uh, and we were going over some of my dissertation work, and one of the places that we were at, he actually pointed out that he would strongly agree and move one of my citations as disputed, being a quote from Second Peter, to actually a legitimate quote from Second Peter. And the more and more I've processed it over time, he may have a good point. So, you have that one, and there's another disputed section as well that I would argue he was either quoting Second Peter or James because they were alluding to the same thing. So he's either alluding to Second Peter or James. So I put disputed there or uncertain as to whether it was Second Peter. It was either Second Peter or James. It was definitely a biblical text. So with that, there could be at least two alluding to Second Peter, which places it in the first century. If 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 Clement has access to this text. Clement of Rome, that is. And he's writing in the first century and he's utilizing its text authoritatively, then 2 Peter cannot be a second century text as some have tried to place it in the second century. It would not go after, it would go before. Clement of Alexandria in the second century, separate from Clement of Rome that we just talked about, he has apparently have written in the second century a commentary on it if you were to follow kind of what Eusebius was saying there. Jerome said this, he, Peter, wrote two epistles, which are called the Catholic epistles. The second of which, on account of its difference from first in style, is considered by many to not be Peter. Now, what Jerome is saying in the lives of illustrious men is that 
there is a dispute. He's saying what Eusebius said. There is a dispute. But he himself seems to conclude that it actually was. He said he, Peter, wrote two epistles, which are a part of the Catholic epistles. He states that there are people that struggle with it because of the style. And again, nobody is disputing that part. We all dispute that. That is a concern for all of us considering this text. Now, another argument that's against it is some will point to the fact that the Muratorian fragment does not hold 2 Peter, along with uh, looking at the Syrian text in their canon that they had in the Peshitta. And I would point out the fact that the Peshitta was lacking more than 2 Peter, also didn't have a revelation. So, I mean, when you, when you start getting into the Peshitta as the basis of canon, you're going to run into a lot of problems. We've dealt with that in the past. You can go back and listen to other uh, clips and, and videos and podcasts on that. But it's not in the Peshitta, so that's one concern. The other concern is it's not listed in the Muratorian fragment. But let's keep in mind the Muratorian fragment is not complete. Uh, there's other things missing in the Muratorian fragment, including First Peter. So when you when you look at it from that perspective, I don't think it can be used for or against. It's, it's, a, it's a no answer kind of situation. Now, coming after Origen and coming after, you know, Clement of Rome and Clement of Alexandria, there are other fathers that would include it in a canonical text and place it there. In fact, Jerome worked really hard uh, to emphasize its canonicity in the Latin Vulgate when he did his translating work. And I'm totally fine with examining the fact that Jerome wanted to reconcile the verbiage, reconcile the syntax, reconcile the style while also understanding it's canonical and belong. So that's what Jerome did. So he would have included it. Athanasius in his letter on Easter certainly included it in his. Gregory of Nazius, I mean, Nazianus, I mean, when you look at him, he, he alluded to it. He obviously would have accepted it, included it. I know he's later, but he would have placed it there. Augustine absolutely included it and, and would have uh, defended its canonicity. The early church as a whole, whether you're talking about places in North Africa, uh, whether you're talking about Egypt with Athanasius and even before him with Origen and Clement, uh, Jerome in Rome, there were apostolic churches, both the Greek churches, the Latin churches, uh, even going down into the Coptic churches, North African churches, they did defend and utilize Second Peter as apostolic and canonical. That cannot be disputed. Now, when they started defending it can be disputed, but the churches and their tradition cannot dispute that aspect. Now, let's talk about some of the internal issues, and I think that's really what this, this comes down to. The argument is somewhat historical, as I just demonstrated. There, there are some historical reasons to be concerned. But, but getting into the internal issues is really where the rubber meets the road. So Second Peter, and I'm going to actually read something here I pulled up from uh, Dr. Darren Lockett, um, I, and I do follow some of his work, uh, friends with him on social media and, and see some stuff he published. He did publish something on Second Peter I thought was pretty good, uh, more so informative than definitive of a position, but it was very informative. And, and, and he states in here, and I actually uh, tried to go back and follow up on some of his claim, and, and I think he's actually pretty spot on with this. Second Peter contains 57 words occurring only once in the New Testament. I would dispute that number a little bit, uh, not fully. Um, once in the sense of in the format that you see them, I think there are some uh, root attachments that can be expressed in other places. But if we're going to be strict, I, I do agree, you will run into about 57 words that occur only here, N not anywhere else in the New Testament. And the largest percentage of any writing that you have like this in the New Testament only 25 of those occur in the Septuagint. So they're not foreign. Now, remember, 2 Peter does utilize extra biblical works. It does go to, uh, it, it certainly alludes to First Enoch, uh, particularly in book one at one point. He's alluding to some of the outside sources, entertaining some outside sources like those. Uh, using some of the language of the Septuagint when referencing the Old Testament. So you can kind of say, well, those aren't unique to him. He was alluding to Old Testament terminology or he was building on Old Testament Septuagint readings 
there could be arguments for that, perhaps on 25 or, or close to 25 of those. But what Darren Lockett says is this. This means that 2 Peter uses many words, 32, that do not appear in any of the biblical texts. And again, I, I strictly speaking, that is the case. There is something new and dynamic to 2 Peter. This is why people push it later, because it is very much connected to some of the terminology in the epistle of Barnabas, the shepherd of Hermas, which place you at the end of the first century into the second century. So I get it. I get the reason for concern. But it seems like to me that Second Peter is actually alluding more to apocryphal works that are older than actually being contemporary works with some of these others. Now, in this, I think the numbers are misleading in, in, in when we deal with 1 Peter, 2 Peter. We say, well, syntactically is different. Agreed. No, no argument. We say that the vocabulary, like Dr. Loggett pointed out, is concerning at times. There's nuanced words that are not elsewhere. They're, they're in the equation. We say that it is style, and its style is different from 1 Peter. No argument there. But I, I think that if we consider all the words... There are differences, but not everything is different. I think it's good to document differences, but I think it's a bad idea to only focus on the differences, but also not the comparisons of closeness as well. Uh, Green adduces the findings of A.E. Sims that in First and Second Peter are as close in word terms as Titus and First Timothy. Now, it's very unlikely that anybody would dispute First Timothy and Titus are probably from the same writer. Now, there is obviously great dispute that they would say it's not Paul. And I have dealt with that extensively. You can go back uh, and, and listen to that podcast. I don't believe it's on YouTube. It is on my podcast, Facts, F-A-C-T-S. Uh, you will find the work that I did there on the works of the pastoral epistles and how I do believe they are Pauline. And I demonstrated that the statistics are skewed on that by doing proper comparison. Again, please go back and listen to that. But nobody would really argue that the writer behind 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus are the same or in the same company or the same group or the same Christian community. They would not dispute that. But Green would adduce from the findings of Sims that they're just as close, 1st, 2nd Peter, as first Timothy and Titus. And the word numbers are very similar. Uh, for example, first Timothy has roughly 537 words, Titus mm, close to 400. Uh, there are just over 160 of those that are in common between them. Now, if you take first Peter, there's roughly 543, roughly, depending on what Greek text you're using. And in second Peter, there's roughly 400 but there's five, 150 in common. So just a few more words in 1 Peter than 1 Timothy and about the same words in Titus as there are in 2 Peter. And there's 160 common words between 1 Timothy and Titus. And there's 150 common words between 1 Peter and 2 Peter. So when you talk about the differences, we don't ignore those. But we don't just... Sit, we do not just sit back and focus on those only. What about those that match? And that's what Green was adducing with Sims' statistics is that we don't dispute First Timothy and Titus's language and possibility of same authorship. And the numbers are just as close for First Peter and Second Peter. So how do you how do you reconcile that? Word similarities, different style, different genre, different way of putting things. That's what I want to explore in, in these next sections. Now, there are some viable explanations. Some of the viable explanations about the differences and who's writing. J.A.T. Robertson, who wrote Redating the New Testament, suggests the following hypothesis. And, and, and I'm not saying I agree with Robinson. I am saying that they are there are good explanations that can explain these differences without just throwing out the hypothesis of it being Peter. I'm not saying we accept everything. I'm not saying that we just run around and, and ignore some of the evidence that's out there. What I am saying is 
we need to consider that there are other explanations to continually show, as we have in other places like the pastorals, that change of verbiage, change of style, change of, of looking into the syntax does not automatically change the author. We have done this time and time again if you follow this program and have demonstrated evidence within the text where you see the same kind of writer changing his style. Now, I'm not saying that Peter literally with his own hand penned 2 Peter. What I'm saying is there's plausible and viable explanations for him being the author behind both. And Robinson suggests this, that Jude begins to write 2 Peter at Peter's request and basically becomes the amanuensis for Peter. Uh, he suggests that 2 Peter and Jude are written around the same time and that he breaks off and writes a shorter benediction, Jude, and continues the project of doing the longer one for Peter, 2 Peter. Uh, he, he breaks off and sends in a shorter writing, Jude, hurried in his own name. Uh, and in verse three of Jude, he says, beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith. So there's two phrases. While I was making every effort to write to you, phrase one, phrase two, I felt the necessity to write to you. Now, Robinson would argue that the first italicized line goes back to 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, the while I was making every effort to write to you. The second phrase is the italicized words, felt necessity to write to you, would take us to Jude's actual writing and only focusing on it. So the first clause goes to 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, saying that he is inserting himself as being the writer then. And then this little short break off is him writing now. Then after Jude is quickly dispatched, Jude completes 2 Peter for the Apostle Peter and uses 2 Peter 2 to connect much of what he says in Jude. So the suggestion is that both are on the table, being written around the same time, and that the materials are relatable, which we'll look at in a minute again. We did this when I actually did the authorship of Jude. The material is relatable of Jude, and it's relatable with 2 Peter 2. And, and it most certainly is very close. So he suggests the closeness of writing suggests the same writer and that Jude is actually writing both one personally on behalf of himself in a shorter form and one on behalf of Peter in a longer form. And that would explain the phrase, while I was making every effort to write to you, phrase one, I felt necessity now to write to you. So when 2 Peter 3, 1 says, beloved, this is now the second letter I'm writing to you, Robinson would argue that's not talking about 1 Peter. He would suggest that he's talking about Jude. Now, I would argue with him because I think Jude actually came after. I think we have reason to believe that Jude came after. Again, go back, listen to that podcast episode, and you'll hear why. I don't agree with this assessment. I'm not saying that it's not possible. I'm not saying that it's not possible that he is the writer on behalf of Peter. The wording is very close. The material is attached. I don't think 2 Peter 3, 1, when he says, I'm writing a second letter to you, he's talking about Jude. Is it possible? Sure. Is it probable? I don't, I don't think so. He'll say that the letter may be Jude rather than 1 Peter, especially since the content of the letter describes 2 Peter 3, Two, that is a viable argument and that it fits Jude better than first Peter. Good point. And Jude may have left another signature in second Peter. He would suggest that the best and probable reading of second Peter one, one is when it has Simon Peter, it has Simeon Peter rather than Simon. So you have the E O N instead of the O N. And the only other person who's recorded as using the Hebraic form of that name was James, which is Jude's brother back in Acts 15, 14. Robinson says it was in the family. 
So the word Simeon at the beginning of Sig Peter is another clue that Jude penned the letter on Peter's behalf. Uh, and again, there is something to this. Look at the comparisons and listen carefully to the comparisons. When you talk about Second Peter and Jude, and if I've gone over this before, so I'm not going to go over, uh, over every one of them when I did Jude. Second Peter 1.5. Now, for this very reason, uh, applying all diligence in your face, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge. Jude, verse 3. Love, and while I was working in every effort to write to you about the common salvation, I felt it necessary to write to you of, appalling, of appealing to you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was handed down to us by the saints. So, you had the comparison connection there. Second Peter 1 12. Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of the things, even though you have already know them and have been established in the truth, which I present to you. And then he does the same thing, reminding him in verse five of Jude. Now I desire to remind you, though you know these things already once for all. See the comparison, the contacts. Second Peter 2 1 compared to Jude 4. 2 Peter 2, 3, compared to Jude 16. 2 Peter 2, 4, compared to Jude 6. 2 Peter 2, 6, compared to Jude 7. 2 Peter 2, 10, compared to Jude 8. 2 Peter 2, 11, compared to Jude 9. 2 Peter 2, 12, compared to Jude 10. 2 Peter 2, 15, compared to Jude 11. 2 Peter 2, 17, compared to Jude 12 to 13. 2 Peter 2, 18, compared to Jude 16. 2 Peter 3, 12, or excuse me, 2 Peter 3, 2, compared to Jude 17 and 2 Peter 3, 3 compared to Jude 18. They're there. The commonality is there. It's clear the writers were familiar with each other, if not the same, which would be the argument for Robinson. So I think he has an argument. I think it should be on the table. I'm not saying I go with it, but I am saying that it is without a doubt something to consider. Here's another viable explanation. Peter wrote this letter himself as compared to 1 Peter. We know from 1 Peter, he did not write the letter. He says as much in chapter 5, verse 12, that Silvanus was in his amanuensis, his scribe, just as Mark was the scribe for Peter's sermons in the Gospel of Mark. Clearly, Peter is not a writer. He's an orator. I think it is very possible the fact that when you go to 2 Peter, there is no amanuensis listed. There is in 1 Peter. Could it be that 1 Peter was so well written because somebody that was more professional with a pen did it for Peter? And here, to personalize this letter, as he's speaking of his departure in chapter 1 and his commonality to Paul in chapter 3, that he is writing a more personalized letter and the grammar reflects someone who's not skilled with the pen. I think that's viable. In fact, I lean this way. Now, again, we've talked about this before. Well, James would have never wrote James because he was a, you know, grew up in a carpenter's home, poor guy, you know. These guys, John would have, we have to remember, and I'll repeat this again, just because they were fishermen or just because they were of some other uh, trade at some point did not mean that once they followed Jesus, became their, uh, became disciples of Jesus and apostles of Jesus, that they stopped after his resurrection and went back to their trades. They continued to follow Jesus and his resurrected glory and power and leadership by the Holy Spirit and continued to train and educate themselves. I believe that it's very possible that these guys who probably have the education of a 12-year-old, that's probably as far as their education went before they went into their fishing businesses, they would have had an elementary understanding that they could have at some point developed. I think that's part of what's wrong with the book of Revelation and its grammar. I think that John probably penned it himself because he was on the island of Patmos. And if you go back and listen to my podcast on Revelation, you'll remember that my argument was simple. He didn't have an amanuensis on the island with him at Patmos. <laughs> he didn't have somebody to write it for him like he did his gospel or his epistle. So looking at Peter here, it is possible that the reason the grammar is kind of eh, not really well done, it's kind of sloppy in its organization, and it's not as well written as 1 Peter, could be because Silas edited and wrote for Peter as he said he did in 1 Peter, but not having an amanuensis here in 2 Peter. 
I think it's entirely possible. Again, another viable explanation. We have to stop with it. Well, the grammar is different, not the same. We have to stop with that. We've already demonstrated how that's extremely incorrect. I'm going to use a nice word, incorrect to assume that just because something changes, it's not the same. Just because somebody writes different can't be the same writer. I, that doesn't work in the commonality of things. I mean, you go study me and you look at my undergrad writings, my research, I suggest you don't. Um, compared to my master's work, compared to my doctoral work, as you see me go through the educational system and continue in my training, my writing improves tremendously by the time I finish my PhD. That, that's just the way things go. So to believe that Peter, many, many years after his fishing journeys, didn't improve upon his writing. <clears throat> he spent time with Paul in Rome. He spent time with Paul in person, in other places, in meetings, in assemblies, in Jerusalem. I mean, do we not believe that he could have spent time with Paul? Paul would have helped develop his training and writing? No, it's not as good as Paul's. No, it's not as well written as some of the Gospels like Luke or, or the book of Acts. But it is coherent and understandable. Could it be that that's what Peter became? 30 years after his fishing ministry in his fishing business, his ministry moved into an apostolic role and over 30 years developed the ability to write to some level. Sure, sure. 30 years is a lot of time. Spending time with Paul, spending time with the other apostles could have influenced him, like Matthew, who had been very literate as a tax collector, learning multiple languages and ability to write up receipts, etc. So let's talk about the internal claims. What about the claim itself? So these are possibilities that could still present it to be Peter. Maybe Jude wrote it for him, as Robinson says. Maybe Peter wrote it himself instead of Sylv Sylvanus or one of the other companions that traveled with him. What does the epistle claim for itself? Well, the writer claims to be Peter right off the beginning of the letter, 2 Peter 1.1. He's also claiming to be an eyewitness. Chapter 1, verse 16. But not just an eyewitness. An eyewitness who was with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Verses 17 through 18 of chapter 1. That takes it down to three people. Peter, James, and John. It's not James. He's dead already. At least Peter and John. And since he's claiming Peter, it's going to be Peter. He's maintaining that he's the same Peter that Jesus predicted his death to. If you, if you read 2 Peter 1.14 very carefully, he seems to be alluding to the fact that his death is at hand as if Jesus told him this would happen. And the only story we have that is comparable to that claim is John 21. Now, I believe John was written after. I think John is written between 80 and 90 AD. I know my semi predis friends disagree. But going back to that illusion... Whether it's, he's not quoting John 21. There's no similarity of wording. He's just talking about, Jesus told me I would die in this manner. Um, we have a full story of that, that John tells for Peter in John 21. So it doesn't negate that John could still be after this letter because there's no comparison of wording. It's just that I'm going to die. Uh, John 21 says, this is the manner that he spoke of his death. But he speaks of this prediction, which would which John confirmed was of Peter. He's also claiming to be writing a second epistle, as we stated earlier. I know that Robinson would say that's referring to Jude. I think it's a stretch. I think he's talking about 1 Peter. Uh, the layout of that, the connection of that, even in the church fathers saying that there's a second one attached to his name. So by investigation of their claims and connectivity, why wouldn't we accept that as first Peter? Could it be Jude? Mm, sure. I think the best argument Robin ha Robinson has on that is, is the very next verse in verse two. 
I don't, I don't think that works. Here's why I don't think that works. When you look at Jude and you look at Peter, it, it it's that Peter is actually being quoted by Jude, not the other way around. Now, before I read those comparisons as I did for Jude, let me say this as well. It should be noted the writer is constantly speaking in the we. Three times chapter one, he says our, as if he's speaking on behalf of a group chapter three. And this is similar to what John did in his gospel. Similar to what he did in his epistle in first John. We beheld his glory. John one. That which we have seen which we have touched, which we have heard, the word of life, writing on behalf of a group. And if you go back and listen to the videos or the audios and the podcast that I did of John, you'll you'll see that I believe that John was a group gospel. I think John was the main guy behind it, but I think that it was other apostles still alive working together to tell the story of Jesus from their perspective, from a perspective that had not been relayed by Peter and Mark's gospel, or by Matthew and his gospel, which I think was also a group gospel. If you want to go back and listen to the two episodes I did of Matthew, I believe the Greek edition of Matthew's gospel is a group gospel from the those left in Jerusalem. I think when we start talking about a lot of the writings of the New Testament, we see that it's actually apostolic groups working on letters and maybe one individual heading it or being the author or the main author behind it, but that there's actually groups working on it. It is possible as well. Now, this is a group gospel on behalf of the apostles that Peter is leading. He continues to say our and us and we in this epistle. Could it be this is a group epistle on behalf of the apostles? I think it's entirely possible. And here, here's why I say that. Because Jude quotes from 2 Peter, and he quotes it as stating that this is the instructions of the apostles, plural. Consider Jude 17 and 18. You beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of Jesus Christ that they were saying, they were saying to you, in the last time there will be mockers, followers after their ungodly lusts. So, so consider. Jude is saying, the apostles of our Lord said this to you and quotes in the last time there'll be mockers following their own lusts. Where, where is that referencing? I think it's 2 Peter 3.3. 3. Knowing this, first of all, in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust. It's, so again, I don't think it's 2 Peter quoting Jude. Jude is going back to a already stated statement and relaying it and saying what they said about this. They said it would happen, it would come. By the time Jude's writing, he's saying it already came. It's happened. You're looking at it. You're watching it. They were accurate. Their predictions were true. It's Jude quoting 2 Peter, not the other way around. But that's why I don't buy Robinson's argument in chapter 3. But what it does point out is that Jude says it came from the apostles' teaching. Plural. Could it be that Peter is saying us, our, we, just like John did, because he's writing on behalf of the apostolic group? Or somebody else is writing it on behalf of the apostolic group. And, and uh, the author or the certifier of this is coming from Peter himself. And could that be why they had a hard time tracing it to Peter, but had no problem tracing it as apostolic? Let's back up. Remember what we talked about at the beginning of this program. At the beginning of this program, you go to the very beginning. Uh, you'll remember me saying that the when you look at Jerome or you look at Eusebius, they did not have a problem putting it in the apostolic group of writings and stating that it is canonical. It was disputed, but canonical, including Eusebius, who is often used to critique it. He struggled with it going to Peter. Could it be they had a struggle of taking it back to Peter because Peter wasn't the only one involved? He may have certified it. He may have moved it. He may have been the approver of it in the end. He may have been some of the wording behind it. It may have been his input in it. But could it be that it was Peter there with Jude? Sure. Maybe some of the others, like his brother, Andrew? Possibly. Could it be that there were others involved in the work of Second Peter? And that's why he says our, three times chapter one, us, we, in chapter three. Very possible. 
And the fact that Jude quotes 2 Peter 3, 3 and says the apostles said to you, it could be a group gospel that Peter certified. And that is why the writers of the early church, the patristics, the fathers are sitting there saying, it's Peter, like Origen or others, or it's being attributed to Peter, but we're not sure. There's some dispute here, but it has certainly been received by the apostolic churches as apostolic. That could explain the disputes amongst themselves. So where do I land with that? I personally do think it is traced to Peter. Uh, I think Peter certified it. I think Peter put his authorization on it as a lead apostle. I do not think that it is a individual gospel. I do think it's him and some others. I don't think he was alone. Uh, could the scribe have been Jude and Robinson is right in addition to that? Very possible. Could it be that Peter wrote it himself? Um, yeah, I think that's possible. I, I kind of lean that way, but I'm willing to change over a little bit to it's a group apostle and there's no amanuensis because the amanuensis isn't writing for a man, he's writing for a group. And perhaps Jude was the designated scribe on behalf of the rest of them. And Peter stamped his certification on it. I think it's possible. I think any level of mixture to those hypotheses are very possible without throwing it out. Just go, oh, there's a grammatically different. Oh, there's syntactical difference. Oh, there's some word differences. What about the similarities? What about the 150 words that are in equal value that are in 1 Peter and 2 Peter? They're close-knit in that many words out of roughly 500 plus. There's still connectivity. There's still unity in wording. So do we just throw it all out? No, maybe there are sections where Peter is speaking and it resembles what he had said for Silas to write or Sylvanus to write for him in 1 Peter. And maybe one of the other apostles comes in and inserts his opinion. And there's a writing that's going on here instructing these people with Peter. And it's kind of a group work. It's possible. But I certainly think Peter is behind it. I think Peter is the main apostle behind it. You say, Stephen, where do you date this? All right. If this is Peter in the apostolic group, which I believe it is, it would be closest to his death. Just based on chapter one, he's speaking of, I'm about to die just as the son of God told me I would. Uh, Peter died somewhere between 64 and 68. He was killed by Nero, likely crucified upside down. There's dispute whether he or Paul were, were one of the two that were killed first. Um, could be Paul was killed first, Peter second. Uh, I tend to lean that way sometimes. I'm, it's hard to say. If later editors and friends of Peter, which is suggested by some, publish this, you would still have to place it before 78 AD based on Jude quoting what I just read to you out of 2 Peter 3. And if you go back to the video, you'll give my dating of Jude being as early as 69, no later than 78. And again, for this program, I don't have time to go through all the reasons why, but if you're more than welcome to go back and explore why. I, I placed Jude no earlier than 69, no later than 78. So this would have to be before 78 if it's later editors doing it, because later editors would be the basis for Jude actually quoting based on what I showed you from second Peter three, three being the source by which Jude quotes as already being fulfilled currently, but it was predictive when second Peter three was written. So I, I would say it would be somewhere in there. So I would place it personally between 64 and 68, the same time uh, that Peter was killed when Peter was martyred somewhere in there. I think he's giving his last will and testaments, and he's doing it on behalf of some of the other apostles that were perhaps with him uh, before his execution. Uh, he knew he was about to die. He maybe worked together with some of his church friends and the apostles that were influencing and around. Um, 
maybe his brother Andrew was there. Jude was possibly there with him. Either way, he was working together with an apostolic group. Is it possible Jude wrote it for him? Sure. Is it possible he wrote it himself in the poor grammar that it was? Sure. Either way, I, I don't think we just exclude this on the basis of that. We have historical reason to identify it to Peter. We have historical reason to identify it as apostolic and belonging in the canon. Uh, we have multiple reasons to believe that it was working with other apostolic works like Jude. Even in the manuscript tradition, we find it uh, very early on connected with 1 Peter, 2 Peter, and Jude, often together, uh, working together. So it was a part of the Catholic epistles. The apostolic churches in all the different regions were using it. There was some early dispute there with the Peshitta, but they disputed more than that one. But as a whole, the major churches and all the apostolic churches throughout the world were accepting it, using it, and quoting from it, and reading it as apostolic, and many quoting it as Peter. So I would accept it, I, I, no, no doubt. I, and, and many of you know this. Um, if you've watched any of my programs, listened to any of my work, I struggled for the longest time. I struggled with going through... <laughs> Multiple aspects of Second Peter. I told the story not long ago to a, a friend of mine who is struggling with some of the canonical statuses. I said, I said, let me let me encourage you on something. I said, there was a time when I sat on my bed. I'll never forget this. It was about five, six years ago now. Sat on my bed. I had my New King James Study Bible out, and it was in Second Peter. For an entire year, I did not preach, teach instruct or read out of second Peter. I had convinced my own self from listening to all the evidence that it's not Peter and it's not canonical. I, I gave up on it. Then one day I was sitting on my bed middle of the night, couldn't sleep. Just, just wrestling with this, going through my doctoral work, doing my research, just as I was instructed to by the professor and I couldn't sleep. And I sat there and I held Second Peter open. And I know this sounds emotional and this sounds non-spiritual. And I but but I put God to the challenge in prayer. I said, God, if this if this book is truly inspired and apostolic, you're gonna have to show me because based on the evidence I'm looking at, I give up. Like I give up. There's, there's no way. And I sat there and I hugged my new King James and I wept and I wept and I wept. And I just told God, I said, you're, you're going you're gonna to have to prove this to me because I don't see it. It was about a week, maybe two at the most later. I was listening to a podcast and I listened to an explanation. Somebody had made a comment about Second Peter and it blew me away. They made one argument about how it's not uncommon for the amanuensis to change in addition to the suggestion I gave that Peter would have learned how to write at some point, his companionship with Paul, et cetera, et cetera. Gave this full-blown explanation. I sat there and was like, man, that's awfully simple. I don't know why I didn't take that into consideration. And I quickly started investigating with a little bit of a perspective difference. I started challenging myself to think more than just one way. And as I investigated that for about another eight to 10 months, I finally came to the position that I have now. And in doing so, I was encouraged. I was excited and restored faith back in second Peter and began to utilize it again. I do all the position I have today, all the explanations I gave you. I am not definitively dogmatic about one of those. I think it could be all the viable explanations combined or one or two elements of them. I don't know which one entirely, not entirely, but I do accept it as canonical. I do accept it as apostolic more than anything, but I do also accept it as being traced to Peter's authority and publishing it. I do like the concept of Jude writing it for Peter, uh, as Dr. Robinson has suggested. All right, so that's my explanation. Here's a couple questions that have come in. I I'll try to take these into consideration uh, in just short time, because we do actually, surprisingly, I got this done under 50 minutes, and I always try to do my programs under an hour uh, on the screen here. Colm, hi, Dr. Boyce. I'm Catholic, but I'm looking towards orthodoxy to be honest. I should give Protestantism a better look. I enjoy your recent podcast episode. Will you have more discussions on this topic here? 
I, I will continue to build on this. My goal is to go through every book of the Old and New Testament and its canonical status and give reasons to why I believe they are canonical, both Old and New Testament. I've already started some of the Old Testament. I'm trying to get the New Testament done first, but every now and then I'll insert some Old Testament stuff. Um, but discussions like this will continue and no doubt I'll continue to get invited to be on other podcasts and other, uh, channels and have these discussions and debates. That's typically the status of this. You come out public with something, you make a, a declaration, people start inviting you, uh, to their podcasts into their YouTube channels. And some people even challenge you on debates. And I, I expect that to happen as I continue to release these. That's always been the case. So you're going to continue to see this. Uh, I am uh, intrigued that uh, you're Catholic and you're looking toward orthodoxy. Um, I would suggest that as a better alternative personally. And um, uh, I, I would certainly say that there are good people in both camps. And I don't ever want to ignore that. I have friends in both. I believe there are good solid believers in both. Um, I would say Protestantism is worth looking into. But I would also say that you need to consider that there are variations of Protestantism. And uh, there are different looks within Protestantism. So if you want to, uh, feel free to go on our website and I'd be glad to uh, take an email from you. We have our an explorechristianity.net. Um, we can further this discussion through dialogue if you'd like. Um, I would like to point you in a better direction of Protestantism because there's some awful perspectives in Protestantism as well. Uh, I also have good thoughts as to some of your questions about continuing these kind of discussions. So if you'd like to feel free to reach out to me, explore Christianity.net. There is an email there. It'll go uh, to one of our uh, team members and they will forward it straight, straight to me. Uh, one more question. We have time maybe for one more people in the church. don't know about most of these issues, disputed letters. How important is it for them to know about this? What would your advice be to leaders in terms of how to address it? Yeah. Santi, uh, great question. I've, I've addressed this. I just recently addressed this uh, with John Beasley at our conference that we did together. Uh, going back to, let's see, that was at the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast conference. Somebody had asked a similar question and, and our answer was the same. It's time to expose people to the reality that not everything was peaches. I mean, like, th like everything just went on. Everybody just quietly accepted everything. There was no arguments, no debates, no concerns. The Bible just naturally flew into place without any dispute. Now, I will argue the fact that the, the canon created almost itself. It was affirmed externally, but the internal layout and how it happened in history did seem to write itself almost. But with that being said, there were times of dispute. Revelation was disputed in Rome. Not really anybody else. Uh, defended at times as well. Uh, Hebrews was accepted everywhere, but Rome, Rome eventually disputed it. And there was uh, religious, religious bias as to why we need to know why that was the case. Second Peter was disputed. James was disputed. Uh, Jude was disputed. The pastoral epistles are disputed. There are disputed texts and we need to have that discussion. And I would advise leaders to expose them to the information and to think outside of the box. And that's what we're doing in these podcasts We're we're taking our time and we're explaining these situations and we're saying, hey, there are valid arguments. We cannot ignore the grammatical syntactical differences. We cannot ignore this new dialect of vocab that comes into play here that's not anywhere else in the New Testament. We have to consider those things. We cannot throw it out. But we have to come up with plausible, viable explanations as to why that may be the case. And I think that means that we're going to have to stop being lazy. I think that means we're going to do some studying. So my advice to the leaders is to expose this information, study it for yourself, understand why you believe what you believe, wrestle with the difficulty and allow yourself to be exposed to opinions you don't like or have never heard. I think there's no harm in doing that. Good question. Got time for maybe one more slam RN Q question. Since you think Jude may have helped write second Peter is the book of Jude also written uh, and better Koine Greek than First Peter and John. Okay, so let's be clear. I think it's possible, based on Dr. Robinson's perspective, that Jude helped write it for Peter. I personally would lean, as I said earlier, with that Peter wrote it himself 
And that's why it's kind of poor grammar. Jude is actually very, very, very good Greek. Uh, that's why people actually are against it being Jude, a half-brother of Jesus growing up in a carpenter's home, because it's too good to be Jude. So there are some that would dispute it was actually Jude at all. Uh, but this is one of the reasons I tend to shy away from it being Jude. Like as in the menuensis for Second Peter, because it is so different from Jude. What is the same, hear me, is the closeness of content that I had already mentioned. Now, there's well over 14. The, the, the closest of content would make us believe that, yes, the, the writer of Second Peter and the writer of Jude are borrowing off each other or utilizing each other or group working together. But the syntax is not the same in Jude as it is in Second Peter. So that's why I don't think Jude necessarily is the actual writer. So I don't think that's the case. Uh, and your follow-up is I am more interested in how the Greek of Jude is. The Greek of Jude is phenomenal. It is actually one of the best in the entire New Testament. Uh, I would I would uh, take Jude as one of the top uh, writers in the way that it's written over many of the other New Testament writers, especially Second Peter. Uh, so... John is very basic. It's well done, very organized. Professional scribes clearly put John together. But the vocabulary is very basic and very elementary, which if you go back and listen to my podcast on John, that's probably because John being the author has a basic vocab as a simple man who grew up a fisherman. And he had professional scribes in, in Ephesus who are very, very, very entrenched in the Greek language and writing, did it so well. So John is very good Greek, very good literature. Uh, well organized philosophically, but the but but the wording is very elementary. I think that can be reconciled by him being the not the writer but the speaker and somebody writing it for him and organizing and editing for him. Same thing with First Peter for Peter, Titus or not Titus, excuse me, uh, Sylvanus doing that for Peter. So yeah, good question there as well. Well, once again, thank you for tuning in, and thank you for the questions at the end there. I'm glad we got some time to take those in. Uh, I, I do enjoy the opportunity to constantly come on here and, and share my thoughts and research with you. There will be more content to come both in the New and the Old Testament. Uh, if you are interested in our work that we do explore Christianity, please visit our website at explorechristianity.net. Uh, pray about being a, a financial partner, even five, ten dollars a month. You can go on there and do that for us. It'll go a long way into our research and our time and sending our guys out to speak. Thank you again for tuning in uh, on this Saturday during a heavy football season. Hopefully you'll be able to come in and watch this with a clear mind. Uh, we ask that you like and share this content, share it with friends so that others can see it. And uh, always, if it's after the fact, you can leave comments on YouTube and Facebook, and I will do my best to come back and follow up with those in time. Thank you so much, Grace 